that's it that's fantastic welcome thomas right and everybody okay right we're getting a few more coming in now right i'm not sure if we can turn the volume down of those people coming into the waiting room i'm um, mm -hmm. not sure how that happens but what I'm going to do is say thank you to everybody for joining in to the webinar. And we're going to be talking about ACEs and opening the conversation. And some of you will have just finished watching the film about ACEs and resilience. And some of you will have previously watched the film. And I, I myself have seen it several times. I'm Beverly Webb. I'm um, a recovery practitioner and the founder of Step Forward Practice. And today I'm joined by five other wonderful panellists and will be um, able to answer some questions from you. We all come from a diverse part of the background. But what's also really fantastic is everybody's part. To ensure that this is interactive, what we've done for the moment is you will always see the panel as we go through and we'll be using... Um, the comments part to enable you to be interactive. So if you're not familiar, if you could take a look either at the top of your screen or at the bottom, and if you can't see where your chat is, there'll be a box right at the end that says more, and just at the top says chat. So for those people that have never used Zoom before, please feel free to look around and um, and just familiarize yourself as well. Okay. So. So, as I said, I'm Beverly Webb. And just quickly, while people are joining, some of the panellists, it was the first time they've actually seen the video. So it would be great to hear your thoughts for a minute. Anybody want to share? Um, yes, oh. really good. Um, really, 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 really enjoyed it. It's my first time getting to watch it all the way through. Um, I, it always it always strikes me um, just the, the, the facts and the figures behind it. I don't think... It, I don't think um, I've, you see them. You see the facts and figures over and over again, but I don't think I, ha I haven't stopped having an emotional response to those because it, you think of all the people that are behind them. And for me, it was the first time I saw it as well, um, and it hit me uh, quite hard. Like somebody said during the video itself, it really struck me. So you know this on an intellectual level, but when you actually see young people, children, and young people, and their families going through it, it is very stark. It's like the great discovery of our times. Um, and the question is, how well are we using that discovery? So I, I was intrigued and loved every minute of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Carol, I know that was the first time for you. Yeah, it was. And um, having worked in a school myself, um, it becomes very apparent how children aren't able to learn because actually what they need to do is learn about emotional well-being first before they start to learn about maths and English and the sciences and, you know, the environment and everything else. But, and so it's about bringing it back to very much the basics so that they're able to express themselves. I think that was the biggest thing that um, came over in the film to me. And Chris, you, I know you've seen it before, like myself, but did you see something different this time? Because you know what it's like every time you see something, you pick up something different. Yeah, it it just reaffirmed to me that the work that we're doing and the conversations that we're having are extremely important and um, more awareness needs to be made of this particular film and um, the approaches and early interventions that are needed so that adults don't go on suffering from stuff that's happened to them in as a child. And Alethea, I know that um, you're very busy at the moment because you're looking you're admitting everybody and looking after the conversation panel. Uh, can Have you got time for your thoughts as well? Yeah, it's not the first time I've seen the film. And 
the second time, I believe now. And what strikes me is somebody who's had quite an extensive research background in cardiovascular, in oncology, in diabetes, in pain management, and other diseases. I've had the opportunity to gather data on people's history and nowhere is there reference made to their own life experiences. So it, it seems like a huge missed opportunity. So it's just, um, it, it really speaks to the importance of the discussions and, and the inclusion of, of um, the ACEs. Well, thank you very much, panellists. And now we're going to start for everybody. So I'd like to take the opportunity to move on to the next slide. And this is what's going to happen in the next 90 minutes, or should I say 85 minutes. So first of all, welcome. I'd just like to say I'm Beverly Webb. I am a recovery practitioner for chronic illness, but I actually specialise in the underlying cause of that, and that's stress, tr stress anxiety and my specialism is trauma and you're you're here from the panelists their own views but we would also like to hear your views regardless of whether you're here for a professional reason or a personal reason and we will come back to that as well everybody's opinions and thoughts and questions are very important because that's what we're doing today we're opening the conversation so let's agree some boundaries as we've already touched on, it's quite an emotive or a very emotive subject that we're talking about at times. So we will be coming back and looking at your boundaries about self-care. There will be an icebreaker because it doesn't matter how tough we're talking about something, there's always time for a little bit of fun as well and relaxation. We're also going to clarify ACEs and trauma a little bit more because very aware that everybody's coming from different views and it can be very controversial. So we're gonna open it up and I'm looking forward to that part because everybody gets to give their views as well. There's an also an interactive opportunity to take part in an ACE poll. Okay, and we'll come back to you later about that. And we will be having time for Q and A and watching very closely the time so that we finish for 2.30. So what we're gonna do first of all is ask for your name and your interest today um, in ACEs. So we're gonna meet the panel. So as you know, my name is Beverly Webb. My interest not only is professional, it's because I'm happy to share as well. I am a person with lived experience of ACEs. So I have experienced in my founding years, in my childhood, um, different experiences of abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, also being a looked after child, um, neglect, various different um, experiences that whilst they weren't all bad, they were, some of them were good but also how it's impacted later on in my adult life, physically, mentally, neurologically, and emotionally. So that's my interest in it. So I'm just gonna come along and I'm at random gonna pick out the panelists. So Thomas, over to you, if you'd just like to share your interest in ACEs. Um, so my name is Thomas Keeney and I'm the chief executive of a group of schools that work with children with complexity and comorbidity. So those young people that we work with range from seven to 19. Um, and sadly, they have multiple ACEs between them, usually because they've been excluded from multiple schools. So by the time they get to us, um, they have trauma, but also secondary trauma. Um, and my interest is in working with complexity and challenge um, because they're exceptional young people. And I believe that our exceptional young people have gifts and talents that lie beside their wounds, and those gifts and talents can show them another life, can give them a different direction uh, with our support and our help and our relationships. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. Chris, would you like to share? Hi, everyone. Um, I founded a charity for survivors of abuse to recover from their trauma from childhood abuse, adolescence and adulthood through mindset, nutrition, fitness and stress management. And my interest in the ACEs is understanding that 
how you were brought up and how you lived, um, what the impact is for future and actually how can we stop individuals becoming unwell as adults if we can bring early intervention into their lives um, to change that so that they can fulfill their potential. So that's my interest in ACEs. Okay, Carol? Hello, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Carol, Carol Randall um, from the Chronic Pain Relief Online Clinic. I've got um, both a personal and professional interest in this as I grew up in quite a dysfunctional household and um, looking at the ACEs score quite high on that because, uh, as a result of um, my upbringing. In, in fact, it um, came into my later life in the shape of chronic illness as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. And I didn't know at that time that you're 600% more likely to struggle with something like fibromyalgia if you grow up in a dysfunctional household. So um, you can see where my personal interest is. And professionally, I work with people uh, with chronic pain where they've been through the system, um, they've got medically unexplained symptoms, but nobody can quite get to the bottom of where the pain's coming from. So we work together to sort of look behind this and find out what the why is. So there's an understanding there. And as a result of that, they can start to release some of that pain that normally goes back right the way through to childhood. And Alethea. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alicia Sterling Chambers, and I'm the founder of the Recovery and Restore and Recovery Practice. And my background is in science and research, but more recent years into holistic therapies. And I do a lot of hands on therapies with people and found that really when working with these sort of physical um, ailments, there's usually an underlying emotional aspect that needs to be healed in order for them to feel better physically. So my interest in trauma and the resilience documentary is around an understanding what other facets, other factors that come into um, ensuring optimal health. Thank you, panelists. Well, I'm gonna go back a little bit because we missed one of the slides, but that's how you know it's live. <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing I want to do is just go through boundaries and especially self-care because we are talking about an emotive subject at times and it can be triggering. It doesn't matter how professional we are. It doesn't matter where we've come from. Everybody is to be aware of how they're feeling. So I've been trying to remind people, have they got a drink? I've got my water here. Are they comfortable in your chair? Even take your shoes off. And if something's a little bit too heavy, remember to breathe. It's okay. If you want some additional support, please feel free to take yourself out. But also I'd like to reassure you as well that we won't be going in depth. This is about opening conversation, but we won't be going in depth to any one case. Okay, so it's an overview. I want to reassure anonymity as well. If you are a participant in this, we can't see um, on the screen everybody else's name. However, when you want to make a comment in the comments, if you don't want your full name to be sh shown, you can change that. So if you don't know how to do it, please can you message directly to Alethea and you can do that on the drop down tab and she can help you. Um, so the options of displaying name are there and you can call yourself whatever you want. We, we will hear you and refer to you as you want to be referred. I think that's very important to reassure you because later on when we do um, have a poll, I want to reassure you that everyone who participates, who chooses to, nobody's name. It cannot be traced in any way. It's completely anonymous on purpose. And that's why it's important for the interacting. And for the interacting, yes, we have panelists and you are able to ask whatever you want. If some of the information you feel you want us to re-explain something or you have an opinion, please put it in the comments because that's what this is all about today. And last and most importantly, is just to remind you, this is being recorded. 
that's because some people will still be watching the resilience film. Some people wanted to be part of this, they pre-registered, but you can also re-watch this as well. So don't worry about write, writing notes too much. Just know doing this live and everyone's part of it. So let's carry on to the next slide. And Beverly? Yes. Yeah, just before you move on to the next slide, I've started receiving comments in the in the chat room. But Fantastic. David, David, the panelist, has yet to be um, Oh, sorry, David. I did that before, didn't I? I'm so sorry. It's because I can only see so many people. David. Well, actually, that's quite nice because there's some people just entering the room as well. So um, you may be last, but you're not least. <laughs> that, 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 that's all right. <laughs> um, my name my name is David Coulter. Uh, I'm the, I work alongside Thomas I'm, as the therapy lead for um, uh, the TCS group of schools. Um, and Throughout my career, I've supported uh, children and adults with neurodiverse needs um, and, tra and, tra and trauma. And um, right now, I'm working in in the schools. Um, and as Thomas highlighted, a lot of our a lot of our children a lot of children come to us with uh, multiple aces. And um, my job and my team's job is to bring them to the seat of learning, support them to be ready to, ready to learn, and uh, support them in addressing um, those bigger worries that they feel. That those bigger worries than than Quite, quite getting to education yet. Um, but yes, that's, that's what I do. Thank you. So now as members of this webinar, if you could actually put into the comment box your interest in ACES and this webinar, that'd be really great. And Alethea will be able to pick out one or two and share them with us, which would be great. Before we continue, um, Bev, I just wanted to um, raise something that there's been a request for acronyms to be explained. Yes, absolutely. So um, as we will see, the ACEs refers to adverse childhood experiences. And that's where we will go into that a little bit more. For those people who have seen the film Resilience before coming in here, they will have seen that a little bit more. So adverse, as we will explain, is something that's particularly uncomfortable for a child to experience. I think that's one way of saying it. And before we get to that slide, so... As an adult, we may make the best intentions or choices for our children in different arenas and fields, but as a child, it might not be received in the same way. So we can select the best school for a child, but when they go to school, they're actually bullied. That's an adverse childhood experience, a child experience bullying. And we will go into that a little bit more, but thank you for that, Alethea. Have you got any other comments at the moment that you've got in the comment box? Yes, there's a, a message here from, from Catherine and she's a special educational needs consultant and cognitive hypnotherapist. She's working predominantly with young people, but also with their families. And she worked within a team who focused much on work of reframing the traumatic memories that have led to the emotions and consequential behaviors. And and she's seen the film before and can't wait until central government understands the significance of this research and reflects this in policy decisions. Well, Catherine, welcome, because you've used one of the words that I love called reframing. And absolutely. Um, so we welcome you as panellists uh, into this conversation. So thank you. Any others, Silethia? Not in yet. Okay. Oh, actually, there's one coming in, cut off the press. This is from Julie, and Julie Hedge, and she works alongside David and Thomas at TCES. Um, her interest is in finding out more about ACEs, and um, so that she's able to make the best decisions for the current young people and future young people, as she seeks to develop new services for the company that will best meet their needs to overcome adversity. Um, so I think um, this would be a good point for panellists to explain what, what TCES stands for. Over to you, Thomas. Julie, um, yes, Julie um, actually rechristened us. We had our 20th anniversary. Julie arrived and she changed her name from Transitional Care Education Services to one that makes much more sense, the Complete Education Service, because we work with every child, no matter how complex they are. 
and there are no children that we will say no to, and we never permanently exclude them. So they're with us for life. They don't get fixed term exclusions because we believe in inclusion. And Julie has done that. So Julie's given us our new name, the Complete Education Service. Thank you. Right. Now, as I said before, before we go into the conversation, there's a way to start it. And what better way to do a bit of an icebreaker and just loosen up a bit because I can already feel we're getting a little bit tense. So I want this to just be really quick. Um, all the panellists, well, including myself, um, I'd like you to be able to go along to the comments section or the chat and just put in one thing that you enjoy about this time of the year. And then Alethea will be able to call out a couple. So it's just to break the ice a little bit before we get going. So as I've got the mic and I'm the head, I'll share it because then we we'll keep it going. So I love the colours of all the trees, especially today on a, a sunny day. Um, for me, it reminds me how special it is to have autumn in our country. Alethea. Well, um, myself and Chris agree with you. We both like the colours. And... Um, Oh, there's somebody here. Julie loves log fires. Oh, yes. <laughs> Nick. Nick Pratt likes frosty grass. Lovely. And Karen likes the sound of geese flying home, but it's better in spring when they come back. <laughs> oh, ah, yes. Like that. <laughs> and, and Carol's linking into her inner child she likes picking up the leaves and roaring like a lion in the park with the grandchildren <laughs> oh no that's a thought so thank you everyone for taking part because also that will help you become familiar with using the chat box so there is some science behind that as well <laughs> apart from just having fun so part of opening this conversation and part of um trauma and stress and the impact it has on us does relate to our childhood but also let's not put it into a box because I'm very much a believer it's about being able to look at this as of a child's view a young person and an adult so what are some of the common causes of stress so there are a few that I've put here but this is a game where it's interactive so family dynamics so any one of the panels so um, Carol do you want to speak more about family dynamics uh, yes, um, I suppose the, the first thing that springs to mind is we can choose our friends, but not our family. So we kind of have to m try and make connections, which can be um, incredibly challenging when we've got dysfunction in our families. Uh, we have codependency as well. We have enabling all types of things um, that happen and we see events that at that particular time, we don't have the skills and understanding of how to manage what's going on the other issue of course it's our norm we don't know it any different um, and uh, so it can can be incredibly challenging say for example if you're in a dysfunctional family perhaps with an alcoholic or drug taker whereby you know the child's not sleeping at night and then they go to school the next day and they're expected to you know be able to engage in what's going on in the school and I'm sure um, Thomas and David and Julie will you know, sort of really understand the dynamics behind all of that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, so the family is quite a challenging place. Um, we are never really prepared for parenthood um, with all the best, you know, upbringing we might have in the world. Um, you know, every day is a new day, not just for our children, but also for ourselves. Absolutely. So, David, do you want to add anything to what Carol had to say there on family dynamics? Um, yeah, yes, and I, I think, um, like you said, there's no, no one's really prepared for parenthood, um, but also um, sometimes we're also not prepared to support support our children or what they, what, we don't know what they're going to throw, throw at us. And with all best intentions, sometimes we, you know, we struggle as human beings ourse ourselves. Uh, and some, also sometimes it's the, the pressure that we unknowingly um, transfer, transfer from our day-to-day -day lives to our, to our children. Uh, and so this is not always a, a kind of what, what you know, 
the obvious big bad things. This can sometimes be this, the more the more subtle, subtle leak kind of leakage of um, uh, of stress. Absolutely, and that goes quite nicely into suppressed trauma. And and for anyone on this webinar who's not sure, Chris Tuck and I have done quite a lot of work, and we're very much about opening conversations and using a voice. And so, Chris, if we can do this between us. So suppressed trauma, we both come from different backgrounds and yet we both have trauma ourselves. So if you were to look at my background, I come from a very toxic family um, dynamic and I was also brought up in, uh, I was a looked after child, so I was brought up in care and fostered and at a very young age lived on my own. And Chris, you lived a similar but different life, didn't you? Yeah, um, so I was brought up in three domestic violence households with um, mum, dad, mum, stepdad, dad, stepmum, um, and then left home at 16. And um, I can honestly say that those relationships that I was brought up in were very detrimental to my, my long-term health. Um, and mix that in with the child abuse and the neglect, uh, yeah, it's really impacted me as an adolescent and as an adult and especially when I become a mum. Absolutely and and as Carol said about parenting it is a different dynamic and the funny thing is is because I went into care I'm one of those people that I say I'm thankful for being in, going into care because I was able to have that support that was right for me as a child and David Thomas you understand the importance of support as a child. Mm, absolutely. Um, so this goes further into relationship issues, causes of stress. Well, we all, doesn't matter how much you're in love with your partner, um, how much you love your siblings, no matter what your age, there are all ta always times when there are issues, but it's when is it, when does it go from what is natural and part of a growing relationship to when it steps over into abuse. And that's always the question when it's unbalanced. So pressurized in a career education environment. And I think we often overlook, well, for me, this is my belief, when we're looking at careers in the world, we're always speaking about the word resilience. And what we never want to speak about is vulnerability. And so we very much get used to having this stress upon stress upon stress. And again, it's very easy to be caught up into that hamster wheel of stress. Where do you step off? Any other thoughts, panelists? Sometimes I think about the transgenerational effects of um, that are on careers and education. In other words, um, our parents um, come to us with high expectations or no expectations. It's almost one extreme or the other. And, and uh, that's imparted to us through osmosis, through the wall, we get that message very clearly from our parents. Um, and that puts our own pressures on. We expect to do better. Our parents constantly want us to succeed and exceed. Um, and it's a huge pressure for our children, actually. And as you said much earlier, these children that we, we talk about, they have to get to the seat of learning. They have to get all the support, which for me is relationships. It's all about relationships. It's all about relationships as an antidote to relational trauma. So in a sense, going back to relationship issues, relationship issues are also the thing that can, we, that can help us the most to resolve those childhood aces and adult aces. Um, yeah. Thank you. Chris, I saw your hand was up. I think as well, when you come from a dysfunctional or uncaring family, um, there is no one to really show you what to do or show you your full potential. So it's really important that every child has that one adult in their lives that actually says to them, you can be and do anything you want to be. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you work hard with support and someone showing you the way, you can achieve. And a lot of people write off children that have come from dysfunctional households or certain um, they think about certain people in certain ways and, and, and just write them off. We shouldn't be writing anybody off. We should be trying to get every child to reach their full potential, whatever that potential looks like. Yes, absolutely. 
Alethea, have you got any comments there from anybody at the moment? There are just some people sharing their favourite things about this year. Oh, so go on, a few more. What, we've got time for more always. So she's um, already thinking about the mulled wine, the <laughs> colour of the wrapping up warm and lighting up all the candles at this time of year. Yes. And um, we've got Pauline Sharp. She likes the sound of the sea. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. And another one tonight is Susina Rinze. She likes the colours and family WhatsApp Christmas credit list. Oh, absolutely. And hello, Zena. Right, we're going to continue with other feelings of um, other common causes of stress and feeling isolated, unheard. I think um, that's that's very common regardless of your age. And unknowingly, one of the things I will say, especially for people that are not aware of ACEs, is that often comes in something that we learn as a child in our early years feeling that we were unheard in whatever way. Now, I really want to uh, reiterate what, something that I said earlier, because we sometimes it's very easy for people to think the only people that have suffered from child, childhood tra trauma are children that have come from, you know, toxic families. That's not true. I know that one of my clients, um, when he came to me, very successful man, very uh, successful in his business and his um, and then his personal life fell apart and it actually went back to when the expectation of him always to do well was very good um, but he was never heard and when he did achieve something nobody was there from his mum or dad were always busy working hard to provide, provide this wonderful home and life but he felt as a child that he was unheard and I think that's something that, you know, even as a mum and, and as a professional, the number of times I look back and think, what could I have done differently? I think it's fair to say that we've all, as adults, able to look back and think and recognise were there times that we could have done things differently when we're older, but not understood that actually, no, this is how we learnt to do it. But it's OK to acknowledge. Anybody else on the panel want to say more about that? I just want to say that the children that arrive to us in our schools, um, they they don't have a voice, and their families don't have a voice, yeah. and they don't they don't participate. They're marginalised and they're isolated. And the biggest intervention we can give them is the ability to give them a voice and participation, but not symbolically. None of that symbolic nonsense. To actually give them a very real voice and for them to feel like they've got strength in their voice and that they're listened to, and that when they make a good suggestion, it happens. And to be honest, that's one of the greatest interventions because it helps them to change their perceptions of themselves. It gives them real esteem around. So voice for me is a massive intervention. Absolutely. It's a change maker, yeah. Absolutely. David, did you look like you wanted to say something? Yeah, and it kind of links with the with 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 the feeling on uh, isolated, but also the above the above uh, bullet point, which is sometimes um, education can be just like you described that person's career. It it can be a, a just a long list of not being heard or a long list of being told to go away for a lot of for a lot of our children who are not understood. Um, so every every time we see we. See, our, one of our pupils come to us with multiple exclusions. We know that that there that's just multiple that's multiple traumas. That's multiple is mm. that's multiple times that that they've been very concretely told you're not worth you're not yeah. worth our effort. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's that's kind of inbuilt into our school our school system that that, that is that the punishment is go away. Yes. So that and that's what our, we're telling our our children. So I think it's quite interesting that when we're talking about this, how does this match up with how we teach our children? And it's quite ironic when you consider that back in the Victorian times we used to say children are seen and not heard and here we are in 2020 yeah. and actually we're saying it in different communication and hopefully now we are given the opportunity and that's why having you know conversations like this raises awareness more and I can't say uh, you know it comes from the heart when I love hearing what you do, David and Thomas, at your school, because I've been one of those children that's gone through the system and not been heard. So I have to say, well, that comes from the heart. 
high expectation of self. Oh, who doesn't have a high expectation of themselves? <laughs> Put my hand up there. <laughs> so, Carol, do you want to speak more about that? Um, I, get, I guess so. It's, it's really difficult, I think, when you grow up with um, trauma and uh, people that aren't able to look after you, let alone look after themselves. Um, and this expectation of self, um, you're constantly trying to reach a benchmark, which actually nobody tells you what it is and you have no idea whether you're getting there and what you're doing, is it any good? And so you just keep this in at this drive all the time. So you're constantly trying to do more, learn more, be more, you know, when is enough enough? Am I, am I good enough? You know, what is good enough? So it's all those sorts of things and all that stuff that kind of goes around in your head. And that's what you lay awake at night and think, you know, even as a grown up um, with work and conversations that you might have had with people in the day um, which they won't even give any thought to but if you've been growing up in in this sort of dysfunctional household it will hurt you know and that will hurt right the way through to your call but actually what you don't do is connect that to what it was like for you when you were growing up the, that those feelings of isolation those feelings of being unheard you know that the, all the suppressed trauma and all that sort of thing, the fi family dynamic. So all of these things that you're saying, which are common causes of stress, come out um, in us as we grow up. And actually, I think they get worse as we grow up because there's always an expectation that as an adult, you'll have the answers. And of course, we don't. We don't. And that's no. once we learn to accept who we are, or one of my sayings of the day for today is be Beverly. Mm. you know we can't fix everything but that takes a learning and I don't mind sharing that because yes I'm a practitioner yes I have certificates etc but also it's great to hear from somebody who's experienced exactly what happens because often we do all experience it in different ways but we haven't necessarily acknowledged it or learned how to actually acknowledge what's happening because we're looking at these common causes of stress and stress in its own way is a good thing at times. It's when we're always in that heightened state and a heightened state of arousal, anticipating something's gonna happen. And I remember being at school and a young person and I'd been taken out of my family home and put back into a second children's home. And I wanted that and it was great. And it was it meant a new school, a new area. Um, I was in class, I loved English and I wrote an essay and I handed it in and it had taken A plus of effort to get that written with everything else happening outside. And yet when I got my mark back, it was C minus in a big red pen. That for me set the benchmark. So high expectation of self. It wasn't that the teacher did anything wrong, is that she didn't know what was going on behind. So then that meant, and even now, and I don't mind sharing because this is what we're doing here. Um, even today, I struggle to get things down in writing. And uh, Carol and Alethea, as practitioners with the chrysalis effect, they both know that. So it's just accepting of ourselves and understanding no matter what age, where we've learned it. And as adults, we sometimes think, oh, yeah, but that was years ago. Well, actually, if we never take time to acknowledge it, it will come out somewhere. So on to the next slide, and I love this one. So we're stressed. Doesn't, again, we're talking about children, young people and adults. And take a look through that list. And I'm gonna put my hand up and say, yeah, there was a, there's a time when I'm stressed that chocolate, I would tell you that I don't like chocolate hobnobs. But if I'm emotional, if I'm tired, if I'm cold and there's a chocolate hobnob there, I'll eat the packet rather than one or two. Um, I've even, I'll tell you, I don't really like wine, but I'll tell you what, if I had a glass of wine now, that would go down right, <laughs> right away. So who's going to be brave enough and just share one or two things that they use as well to help self-medicate when they get stressed? 
Anyone on the panel? Anyone putting comments into the chat? Confession time, Beverly, is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, overworking. I may be known for overworking. I've tried to stop sending out the four o'clock in the morning emails, but it's an interesting one. I've never thought of it before till right now, how that is a way of coping uh, with stress and all sorts of things, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. a wonderful way. So I've had my realization today yeah. that my overworking might well be compensating for lots of other things. Um, and, and trying to reduce stress by not thinking about things and just working all of the time. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, because it's about creating balance and that's yeah, sometimes yeah. the hardest thing. Alethea, what about you? Oh, well, I'm just looking at a comment here um, from Fozia. She said she used to use comfort foods, but now uses non-food treats. <laughs> oh, that's very so good. <laughs> what are one of the non-food treats, Foz? I'm putting them on the spot there now. <laughs> There's another one here from Catherine. Um, Catherine says overworking as well. Mm -hmm. And as it feeds, oops, they're moving, feeds the feeling of not being good enough and drinking yeah. to numb the difficult. Yeah. Um, Chris, I can see your hands raised. Um, I think for me as well, I just want to um, give Thomas a little tap on the hand. I used to have a boss that used to work till like three, four o'clock in the morning oh, really? and being on the receiving end of that, no, I felt no. that I had to step up oh, and no. then be there doing the work to meet her deadline. So she was wearing herself out. I was wearing myself out. Yeah, and yeah, in the yeah. end, yeah. it yeah. didn't help any of us. No, I agree. <laughs> in fact, I've had a staff intervention a few years ago. Um, so they all appeared um, and I'm trying very hard. It is better. Although Julie is saying in the notes that uh, it's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> but I do get the overworking because it's a way of you just um, yeah. trying to build your own self-esteem and your own self-worth yeah. and yeah. making yourself feel that you are yeah. Um, good enough. Yeah. yeah. You're absolutely yeah. Right. So, Carol, is there anything there you're going to be honest about and share? Yeah, and I was just thinking some from the comments from the panel um, that's particularly with the overworking is um, not having that cut off switch, but also not knowing when is enough enough. And that's the same goes for, um, I mean, my particular thing is not listed on there, but it's about learning, you know, getting yet another certificate to try and prove some self-worth, you know, when, when is enough enough. And I just, um, I don't have a cut off switch. Um, and if somebody wants a room decorated back in the past, I would do it until it was done. It didn't matter what time of the day it was that it finished, but I had to get it done. Same with work, same with study. Um, it's one of the things I've had to learn to um, put into a bit of a box and say, well, I'm only going to do this for, say, four hours or whatever, and then put a break in. So I have a lovely coloured coded diary now, which I follow. So that it does put in the breaks into my day because I just wouldn't stop and I won't switch off. And that's what's, you know, when you see a list like that, we can all see now from our own point and then we're able to see some of the signs of the children or other people, young people, you know, being on the TV so much, on the computer, um, isolation, shutting yourself away. Yes, it's lovely to have your space and it's important to have your own space. But when it's something is becomes too much, even something good, if it's too much, it becomes bad. And it's about having that balance. So recognizing the stress, recognizing the coping mechanisms. And I'm very much about, if we can see it in ourselves as adults, then we're able to hear the children or even see the children because sometimes we don't see it. So any other comments, Alethea, before I turn on to the next slide? Fazio has come back to share her non-food treats and that's bath time or knitting. Oh, lovely. Karen said she used to drink gin and lots of it, but gave it up for Lent last year, hasn't gone back to it. Wow. Yeah, and interesting from Cherry, she says, um, Cherry Rudge, she's a professional hoarding practitioner. And she says that unfortunately, many of her clients have experienced ACEs, which affect their ability to trust others, to help them and to help them live with clutter. 
Um, disorganization or hoarding behaviors is something that you have to deal with, and often they shock to self soothe, especially if they manage to get bargains. Yeah. And an I, interesting job. Mm, wow. Yeah. And that's what's so lovely about this conversation. People mm. are coming, you know, we're all coming at it from different areas, which is great. That all adds to the conversation. And I realise, Alethea, you haven't actually shared in what you use. I was hoping I'd duck out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to get myself busy being a bit of a perfectionist. So I, I tend to just keep myself busy trying to solve everybody's problems. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and these are all acceptable because addictions, because if we do them too much, they become addictions and some are socially acceptable and some we don't actually realise. And it's quite a surprise when we do. So there's no judgment here today. It's just about awareness. So on to the next slide. Now, this is really interesting because when we talk about um, the impact of stress, the impact of stress has a physical mental, neurological, and emotional impact. Now, um, the British Psychological Society, um, even as part of their psychological practice and guidance regarding disclosures of non-recent child sexual abuse, back in May 2017, I took part in this. And I also have um, authority to share that document if you want to see. But they're saying about how the underlying causes of anything physical, often it's the emotions we've shut off. So we're just starting to dig deep here. So, it, you know, our body is built to keep us safe and survive, but it's often our body that is trying to have a voice and get us to be aware of how we're feeling and reacting to stress. So as I said, stress is good in a short, short term, but when it's long term, even as children, how many children have um, said they, they feel sick? Now, there isn't actually a reason, but often that's anxiety. And we can often dismiss that at times. But actually, our stomach is saying there's something going wrong. There's something I'm not feeling safe at this moment. But unless we're aware of it ourselves as adults, how are we able to open that, that conversation and enable that child to be aware? So, David, Thomas, is this something that you're yeah, aware of? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really interesting because it came up in the, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the movie as well, in the documentary, the, the life expectancy difference between uh, people born in the same, same city. And it reminded me, of, um, it reminded me of, of an example. I, stu I studied in Aberdeen in Scotland a long time ago when I was studying, and they did a study of um, two, two ends of a street a mile, a mile apart and they find that there was 11 years life expectancy difference wow. on that one in that one street. So and, and that all and that was all before, um, well, before kind of aces were talked were talked mm. talked about even a tiny bit. So they were like, how could this this possible possibly be? So it's, I, I think it's a really key component. Then when we when we um, when we are supporting our children in the school to think of them really holistically and not separate not separate mind mind and body. But to, to include that as, as as one, and we see that mind, body, and family. Actually, family is the other part of your yeah, yeah. your body as well, I suppose. Mm. Um, mm. Um, and that's that's very important. Anybody else want to have anything to say to that? Anybody in the audience as well taking part? Alicia, have you got any comments? There's a comment from Catherine who unfortunately needs to leave, but um, I think if she is able to get access to the recording, she can hear the answer. But it's from earlier on, and the question is, does the panel feel that parental anxiety can in turn trigger anxious responses in their children? Thinking here specifically of families where anxiety fuels demand avoidance behaviours. Because many families that I know are blamed for their children's anxious behaviours or it is labelled as attachment disorder when in fact practical strategies for the family might be helpful. Well, I know myself when I very first started as a professional um, seeing ACEs and personally, I remember I was already a parent then and I remember feeling, oh, 
what have I done wrong? What have I created? And I think there's always balance. So as a parent, there we always look at ourselves. So I'll be very up frank and honest here. Because of my past, I went to parenting classes. I also, when my children have become old enough, my children are now 30 and 28, I've actually been able to say to them, as a parent, I've done everything that I believe right at that time for the best decision for them when I say right the best decision however as a human being if I've made any errors for that I apologize now I felt that that was a great way for my children to see that it's okay to evolve it's okay to make mistakes so yes I I hear what Catherine's saying I think that's an important part and I think also that comes in coalition with the school as well because the relationship for young children the important ones are not only the family it's also at school so because that's part of their environment does anybody else on the panel want to add to that I've just saw a comment from Karen which is really interesting and links into what we're talking about I'm um, sorry I'm still in your job Althea I don't mean to it's just such a link um, she talks about her daughter is going on 12 to 17 12 going on 17, often says she feels sick. I never thought it might be anxiety. She's just been diagnosed with dyslexia and that has helped. And it's really interesting. I'm just going through that with my son at the moment. He's just been diagnosed uh, dyslexic and we never knew. And he was wonderful at covering the strategies. And he's also um, got anxiety. So we're, we're, our children can be wonderful at hiding these things. Um, I always thought he was um, Irish and Jamaican in his laid back approach to life. But sadly, he is uh, he's describing quite a, quite a lot of anxiety that he holds in his body around exams. And of course, dyslexia is helpful in that it, um, it, it helps him to know that there's a reason for that um, for the first time ever. That there, so, so I think that the anxiety, some anxiety is misplaced, a bit like we describe in ACES terms. Um, and some anxiety is actually really well placed. So as you say, Beverly, it's getting a balance between the two, isn't it? Absolutely. And often when you say that um, it's been hidden, um, often we don't know how to voice it. It's just yeah. become the norm. Yeah. You know, when we go, have we ever, have you ever had um, a time when you've gone to a doctor about something and they say, how long has this been going on? You go, a week, oh, two, oh, three. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's become the norm. There's another comment here from Nick Pratt, and I don't know what um, Nick does, but he says he recognises the sentiment of feeling sick himself when anxious as well as in children he's worked with. Yeah. Symptomatically, it can be a real indicator to support assessment. Um, Nick, is, uh, Nick is a LADO, by the way, a local authority designated officer for safeguarding, one of the best in London. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's what he does for a living, yeah. yeah. There is actually a scientific reason about why it goes to the stomach first as well, because our stomach is the biggest organism in our body. And people think it's our head that tells our stomach what to do. Actually, it's the other way around. So 85% of our messages to our brain come from our stomach. And I won't bog you down too much with science, but that's where our vagus nerve starts in our stomach and goes up through the core of our body, through our heart, through our chest, through our throat and into our brain. And when, as we saw in the, the film as well, we then, it goes up and it splits into two. So when we start to sense that we're in danger, it then reacts. And then what our reptilian part of our brain, the back part of our brain, shuts down the other parts of what's of our body that we don't need at that time to keep safe and that's when the adrenaline flows through so that's often the sickness is the starting of that it's like i don't feel safe now whether or not that's true at that time that's a different conversation but that's what's happening and that's when we look at it from a holistic somatic point of view and I'm you can hear that I'm very passionate about learning this about being aware of this because even as young children if we're aware and now as even some of us today as adults will go away with different learnings and start to think oh what's my body trying to tell me and that's that's one of the things that we we also try to focus on with when our pupils arrive is that emotional literacy 
um, and being able to attach emotional words to to those feelings because I, I, as people have highlighted and as children will say I, they don't have the word for saying I'm anxious they'll have the word for saying I'm sick and then it's about the adult in the room to interpret that so it's help empowering them to be heard by being able to label those those emotions and when we label those emotions then we can engage with them a little bit more and, 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 and tackle them a little bit more absolutely Chris you've got your, your hand raised I was just going to agree with all of what you're saying, um, you know, because the body senses, it's the gut instinct, isn't it? It's the classic, what do you feel in your gut? Um, if you don't feel safe and your body's telling you, your brain will eventually catch up and the cognition will kick in and then you can start trying to work out why your senses have kicked off and why you feel that you're in danger, whether it's real danger or not real danger at that present time. Um, but I wanted to go back to the anxiety just for a moment. And um, I do believe um, many schools, not obviously Thomas's school, but many schools, colleges, universities do not understand that children are going through fight, flight, freeze. They might have heard of trauma and they might have heard of the stress response, but they don't actually really understand it because they're not following through on the treatments that children need in order to make them reach their potential in their education. And that's why it's so lovely to have Thomas on. Sorry, I've forgotten the other panelist name. And David, the lovely David, David um, and hear about what their school is doing because what they're doing needs to also be understood yeah. in mainstream education yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Alethea, anyone else from in the comments box? Got anything to say? Not necessarily on this particular bit, but there are a few questions that um that haven't been answered. Yes. Okay. There is a, a question from Julie. So I can go back. It was earlier on. Let's see if I can find it. Almost there. <laughs> You're doing a sterling job, Alethea. <laughs> just while we're waiting for Alethea, Bev, um, I just want to come back to anxiety just to say that um, anxiety is an emotion, not a condition. It's, it's about the fear of unknown future. It's our interpretation of potential events and threats um, such as uncertainty in our lives, insecurity in our lives. So um, just wanted to kind of clarify that and yeah. say also um, it's absolutely the same chemicals that we're making for anxiety as well as excitement, but it's the way we interpret that with our, our perception of our world. Absolutely. And that's where it's really interesting as well. So when I talk um, about self-care one of the things it's learning is that the anxiety and the fear if you're fearful about something it's looking after yourself but also on the other end when you've been over excited it's also about keeping yourself um, looking at your self-care afterwards when the adrenaline drops off because that's where we get the cycle of being ill being well being ill being well and you see that in children as well when the now, I remember being a child and getting really so excited it was Christmas morning and then we're not well. So it's it's finding a way to balance, not to be in a flat line, <laughs> but having that awareness. Aletha, have you found the question? It was actually from Catherine. And the question to the panel is, it says, does the panel feel that parental anxiety? Did I read this already? Oh, yes, we were starting. Yeah, that's the question that we had earlier. Yeah, thank you, Alethea. Thank you for checking. Yes, so if everyone's happy, we'll go on to the next um, slide. So this is where we're now going to actually talk about what, it, what are ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And this was very much a um, review that happened in the early 80s. And it was two doctors, and one of them is Dr. Politi. And he was working with lots of, um, of his patients and he found that 10 
different scenarios were the most common things that were coming up in all of the, his tests. So he put together an ACE score, which has now become very controversial. Some of it is because of some of the wording used at the time. So when we're talking about domestic violence, the word mothers and stepmoms, and as we know, domestic violence isn't just against women, it's also against men, or you can have same-sex partners too. So what I've done is taken those um, same ACEs and just made the, um, the headlining of it less denominational because also it we talk about um household dysfunction but that dysfunction doesn't have to just be in the household especially where we have several families now anyway it won't necessarily be in one household so let's look at the three different areas of adverse childhood experiences or aces the first one is abuse the misuse of power emotionally physically and or sexually. And I say and or when we talk about sexually because there are other conversations that we've had in the past that sexual abuse is also physical and emotional. It's not on its own. Neglect, not meeting the needs of the child physically or emotionally, not providing food, not providing um, a loving environment. And poverty does come into this, but it's not only in poverty that can happen and I do know with some of my clients as well that it actually also happens from families where there's lots of money as well now in the original ACEs it would say household dysfunction and I've classified it as environment because I think it's important that we look at the environment around us especially as we get older you know who are our friends who are the people around us when we're working in our learning capacity and our, is it the right environment for us is our career is the company that we're working for is the office is that quite is that working for us it's all important but going back as a child some of the different factors come in are where you were looked after child what's the looked after child mean and this again is um I enjoy opening this one because a looked after child is anyone looked after anyone other than both birth parents. That could mean you're looked after by your grandmother, your auntie, a sibling, you in um, children's homes, fostered, but also boarding school. Prince Charles is very vocal about this, about how he was sent to boarding school and how much it affected him and his his growing up and the skills that he learned and the trauma. And I think we've seen that played out as well quite a lot. Vicarious trauma. And we, Thomas, you touched on this a little bit earlier and secondary trauma, uh, vicarious trauma. And um, when we witness, when we see, when we're in roles such as today, when we're working with other people that have trauma themselves, we, we can become traumatized. You know, as parents, when our child is not well, that is a form of stress to us. Um, when it's a niece or a nephew or a close friend. Bereavement. Bereavement, you know, that comes in very different ways and affects us in different ways. But it's hard enough as an adult and we're trying to look at how it affects us. Imagine being a young child and someone very close, whether it be in the family or at school, has died. And they're all different types of bereavement, suicides included in that. And I do think it's important that we voice this because silence only exacerbates. So this is a little bit difficult for some people at the moment. So I want you to be very aware of your self-care. Panelists, is there anybody that would like to add anything to these three areas? Because this is an overview. Are there other experiences that you'd like to put in? Well, can, can I just say, there's, there's one thing that really strikes me. We look at, they looked after children there. Some of our children who come to us have had um, 35 moves in three years. Yeah. So if you think about those amount of moves, 
from foster carers who try their best, perhaps are not trained really well, um, don't have the training to work with the multiple traumas, um, but equally implicitly tell those children that they're going to care for them, they're going to love them, they're going to look after them. Um, it's actually a, quite a healthy attachment disorder, if you think about it, for those children not to trust if they've been let down that many times by the adults around them. So, so that's just multiple secondary trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And I can't imagine how ingrained that must get for those children. Um, just uh, if you think about it, the exponential level of trauma that they're constantly living with, um, it's quite something. So look after children. Um, there are different experiences, and I may be um, linking in to Beverly and, uh, and, and Chris in relation to um, previous conversations we've had. But yeah. that, that is the perfect example for me of continuous, never-ending trauma until we, until we put a stop to it, until we decide as adults to do something different, to hold these children and to stick with them and to never give up, in a sense. <laughs> Chris. So just to add on to that, Thomas, I moved homes nine times and schools seven times up wow. to the age of 16. And all I ever wanted was a roof over my head, security and stability. And that's what drove me to work hard. And I've been in this same house now for 25 years and I don't want to move. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it, it's, um, and I feel safe with this house and this roof over my head. So I'm sure that when it comes for time to move, that's going to be a yeah, yeah. whole nother trauma for me. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Lee, no, one no one's shifting Chris. Uh, yeah. Chris, is, Chris is there to stay. Oh, so. absolutely. <laughs> Alicia, anybody else adding any comments? Yes. Is there anybody else that's um, joining in in the comments on there's, this? There's, some, there's a comment that's come from Karen Meadows and, um, and Cherry Rudge. They're talking about hoarding. So first of all, Cherry is saying that people with clutter-related issues often exhibit symptoms of neurodiverse conditions like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, but are treated for mental illness without investigating the root cause of their anxiety. Um, or depression, etc. And they may build physical walls of stuff to protect themselves from further trauma. For example, if they've or had forced clearances or unhelpful or damaging systemic support. So again, the underlying causes aren't, aren't addressed in those instances. And Karen Meadows says she's about to start helping a hoarder clear their house and they are willing and the lovely 80 year old lady said to me, she had to leave home suddenly and leave everything behind. So she has almost self-diagnosed, but has never had any help. Mm. Absolutely, oh. absolutely. And you know, when Cherry says about someone being made to clear their house, that's trauma in itself. You know, there's a secondary trauma because it's not a choice, it's about you know, I'm very much a believer in recovery and acknowledgement and having awareness, but enabling um, everyone to have their self-care and awareness so that they make choices going forward. Because often, especially as children, we didn't have a choice in what happens to us. Right. Anything else before I move on to the next slide? So just, you just um, what you just said just then, Beverly, and... Um, the word powerlessness came up and I think this feeling of powerlessness you know that it, it can really perpetuate the trauma. Absolutely, absolutely. So here we go, so part of the passion today as well we are talking about children and it's really fantastic how we're coming at this from different dynamics but I think it's really good for us to be able to recognise that how a caregiver's trauma can impact a child's development. And that came up earlier in Catherine's question as well. So it'll be great for Catherine to see the replay of this. And this is something from NICAM. I do have permission to share it with you. I have certificated with them as well. So David, would you like to share some of the impact that you've seen sometimes that is unintentional with children in early development? 
Um, yes. When I, there's one, there's one example I always think about when I when I'm trying to exp explain explain this because it can be a bit odd. Is I don't know if you ever ever seen a video of um. Maybe you've seen it with your own children, where a, a child will run into something or bump into something, mm -hmm. and they're absolutely fine. They, they don't cry, they don't make a noise. But when they see the adults in the room, go, <gasps> then then they start to cry, and then they realise some, some, something's wrong. Mm. I think sometimes that's what that's kind of what we what we do is we project our our perception of the world then down on down onto our children children and often we see well, often when we're supporting our, our young our young people oftentimes uh, that that support yes it's with with supporting our children and accessing school but actually it's also supporting our our our, our family units about them accessing school and them accessing education and their belief and feeling that they've attached to, to education and their and their wariness of professionals because not only has that child been let down by schools and teachers or by professionals that adult has been let down by social workers by therapists and so they so when they see 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 anyone coming saying we've all oh, we can support you. They go, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard it before. I've heard it before. What are you? What are you going to do different? Yeah. I, and then again, then that um, kind of compounds then 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 the, the the children finding it hard to access that those 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 things those things as well. Um, so yeah, that that's where I would all, all, always start. And I think it's really also really then key to 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 what this diagram shows is the impact. Um, just before, even before someone's born, and, and the impact on the develop on the on the on the early early development. Um, I think the the ANS uh, the autonomic uh, nervous system is a really key one in the limbic system as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's the first example I would go to, uh, go to when we're considering this. One of the things I wanted to highlight when I very first saw this, one of the things personally um, that really caught my attention is the woman carrying the fetus being pregnant now. As I said, I have lived experience and I've been in a conversation um, when I actually had both my pregnancies, they were normal term pregnancies, considered normal term. However, they were extremely traumatic and triggering. I didn't realise at the time because I'd to survive my childhood, I'd actually disassociated physically, emotionally from my own body and feelings. And suddenly there was a being inside me that I wanted to love, I wanted to break the cycle. I didn't know how. So it took um, the crashing and the breakdown for me to be able to say, I need help. I, this is what I want to do. I don't know how to do it. And then when you see how a person who is, who's had a caregiver with untreated trauma may be prone to PTSD after trauma, I remember even at that time having my children, um, having a midwife who was trying to tell me that to breastfeed my ch child was the best thing because obviously it's natural um, attachment, etc. But they weren't asking me. So when we look at the trauma that happened there vicariously, I didn't know about ACEs but one of the things I didn't want my children to do was sense that I was uncomfortable if they came too close to me and that's why I chose not to breastfeed them. So it's amazing even at that early age how it can impact and Chris I know you have things to say about that as well. Yeah, when I look at that, I almost feel really guilty. And I don't think I'm probably the only parent here that who's gone through childhood trauma that might feel guilty that you've um, inadvertently passed things on um, to the next generation when we all we've tried to do is do things differently. Um, and, you know, like you, Bev, when I've had two children and the, uh, the trauma of going through... Um, uh, pregnancy and birth especially when it's going wrong and the powerlessness that you feel and the way that the body holds on to the trauma that you've gone through and then the, you've got all of these people telling you what to do and you're fighting for yourself yet you're trying to do the best for your child as well I couldn't breastfeed I had a breakdown when my son was 18 months old because I couldn't reconcile how this little baby that I loved and would protect with my life why didn't someone do that for me 
And that is when I had my breakdown. And basically, I know many women that have gone through what we've gone through, and they've had the same outcome, yet it's not spoken about. It, it is just, you know, and now, as you know, my daughter is nearly 18, and she's got anxiety issues, uh, panic attacks, etc. And I'm now thinking, uh, have I have I caused that? And it doesn't make me feel good. No, and thank you for your honesty there, Chris, because mm. that's, you know, this is where it's all encompassing and it is the cycle of trauma. And this is what we're here about. So at the bottom, it's breaking the cycle of trauma. And how do we do it? Where do we start? Where's the trick, chicken and egg scenario? So this is the bit I'm most passionate about because I've been in a scenario with um, six different social workers and they came to one of the screenings that I did in London all about ACEs and the resilience and they were sat there with the questionnaire of resilience of ACEs sorry and they said we've been asked to give this to our young people and we don't know what to do and I said well ask them the questions open the conversation and they were saying but we don't feel that we're comfortable and I said what is it you feel uncomfortable about and they said well look at some of the questions and I said okay so what is it that you don't want to ask and they said but the questions are quite detailed and so I put back to them I said the questions are, are there but they only have to reply yes or no they don't have to actually go back to each incident of what's happened but by you asking them and they saying yes or no, you're giving them the opportunity, not necessarily today, but you're giving them the permission that it's okay to have that voice where they might not know exactly what's going on. So going back to that poll, we, it leads on nicely into we've got the interactive poll that you can actually take part in and actually find your ACE score. Now, this is completely anonymous. You don't have to join in, you really don't, but it also gives you an idea of how things can happen. Now, I also want you to be very aware of your self-care, okay, because that's something I'm always considering, especially if it was your first time. I remember the very first time I came face to face with it, a score and it was quite shocking. So I've actually changed the word. I'm also going to say is this is um, going back to between the age of 0 to 18. So it's you're answering as a young person. OK, and it's when you're thinking about it, it's when you are either at school or at home in your environment. So we'll just go through one at a time. For those of you that want to take part, please do okay um those who don't that's okay so on the first question and again it's yes or no did a parent other person or other person often swear at you insult you put you down or humiliate you or act in a way that made you feel afraid that you might be physically hurt so the next question did a parent or other person often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? And that very much comes in with bullying, especially at school. Did an adult or person at least older than you ever touch or fondle you, or have you touched their body in a sexual way? or try to actually have oral, anal or vaginal sex with you. Now that question is quite challenging to, to ask somebody, but imagine being an 11 year old girl or a eight year old boy. If that's actually happening, what you've given them is awareness of, of what's happening to them and you've given them permission. Okay, I might not, I'll only put yes. I might not want to talk about it today, but I've given permission to speak about it. Did you often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important and special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other or support each other? 
Did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes and had no one to protect you? Or your parents' carers were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you felt unwell? Did you witness another person being regularly pushed, grabbed, slapped or had something thrown at them, being kicked, bitten, hit with a fist or hit with something hard? or repeatedly hit or threatened with a gun or knife. Now, amazingly, that question, traditionally, people would recognise the trauma about seeing a gun or a knife, but they might not recognise the effect witnessing somebody being continually harassed, pushed or slapped has. Okay. Did you live with anyone else who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs or any other addiction? And I added the one, any other addiction, because historically we used to think of addiction as being street drugs or alcohol. But actually, that's not always true, as we touched on earlier. Was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Now, that one, when you think, if we're adults and we're looking at this some time ago, we were brought up in an environment that we didn't talk about anything to do with that. Think of the silence around that. That brings on other guilt, um, judgment, all those other fears, shame. Were you a looked after child by someone other than both your birth parents, by another family member, boarding school, care home, fostered or adopted? Did either parent spend time away in prison? And again, can you see how we're given permissions? We're not asking what actually happened. We're opening those questions. Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Now, years ago, when most of us were younger, that wasn't the mainstream. Nowadays, that is a massive part of every day. Or did either parent work away from home for long periods or live in another country? Have you lost a parent, sibling or close person through bereavement or suicide? So thank you for taking part. I'm going to end the polling now. And what's going to be clever is I'm going to share the results. Now I can tell you now I've practiced this and practiced this. So now we can see. So of all the people taking part in this interactive webinar, on the first question, 77% of people I, uh, has either been in, um, sworn at, insulted, put down or humiliated or acted in a way that they were frightened of being physically hurt. That's 77%. Again, the next question, 69%. Now, can I just ask, rather than keep going through every question, can everybody see the results that we're looking at? Yeah, you can all see the results. Are there any comments coming through, Alethea, in the, in the chat room? No, it's just um, confirmation that um, the results can be seen, are being seen. Fantastic. So again, um, in here, 31% of people taking part in this day was abused sexually in some form or another. 54%, more than half, felt that nobody loved them or thought they were important or special or unsupported. So I'm for a moment going to just take you back as children. We're, we are adults today, but these we were children. So this is when you look back to where we were. So only 23% didn't have enough to eat or wear or, or have dirty clothes to wear. Um, I will say I'm one of those people, I know what it's like to live in abject poverty with no food and going to school was an absolute bonus. But then when I went into care, it absolutely went the other way. And even learning to juggle that took some doing. So I am, that's where I'm grateful for being in care. Witnessing domestic violence, 31% of children witnessed dom domestic violence or another person being threatened. 31% of us um, lived with someone who was a, um, a problem drinker or an alcoholic. 
And again, mental health in the home, 31%. Being a looked after child, 23%. And 38% at that time came were had parents that were separated or divorced. So I'm just gonna stop sharing those results. And I'd just like to, let me take that down. Any thoughts on that panelists? Anything that surprised you or any thoughts that came to you as you were seeing that happen? Uh, Beverly, I thought that, um, I thought it did what you said. It opens up a conversation. It allows somebody to decide whether they're ready for that moment or they're ready for the future. So I think that like all good counseling and therapy, that it's, it's creating an awareness so, um, yeah, I wasn't shocked. Uh, as an ex-social worker, I wasn't shocked when I read that. I thought that was a really good way to open that conversation. But, but at the same time, w one would have to have a lot of self-care in place, just in case, because it, um, it could provoke uh, memories, repressed memories, et cetera. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's important because I am going to re reiterate again for everybody taking part in this today, because that's an important part. Anybody else on the panel that wants to say anything about that, Paul? I think it's also a good way to, to as, as you highlighted with the, with the gun and the knife, that we can normalise things um, very, very easily as a part of our own strategies to cope with our emotions. We normalise a lot of the things that may have happened in the past. And this is this is a good way, as you said, to highlight maybe these aren't normal and highlight. Oh, hold on, hold on a second. Maybe maybe I maybe I can talk about those those things. Um, yeah, it's very common for um, everybody to experience one or two of those aces, but in a score of ten. If you score four or more, you're 32% more likely to have a chronic illness diagnosed later on in life. As you were saying about shortening of life, as you get up to sort of a score of eight out of 10, you can shorten your life by um, life expectancy of up to 20 years, your life is shortened. Now, I'm gonna be completely honest here. The very first time I saw that, I went into shock because my ACE score is nine. However, it doesn't have to stay like that. Um, Chris does a lot of work with ACEs as well, Chris, don't you? Chris? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do through, through the charity. Um, yeah, because um, many people just don't even understand that they have choice in life as an adult. They think that what they've gone through, not everybody, but some, think that what they've been dealt they have to live with and when I explain to them but you as an adult have choice and you can choose to go and get an education you can with support obviously because it's hard for a lot of people but actually the world is out there and you are allowed to do and be and um and enjoy um you can learn to live you can learn to love and that and the amount of people that go really it's staggering how stuck we get in what we think is um, normal and we can't step out of that. And a lot of people need that encouragement, that nurture, that care as adults to be able to step out of their comfort zone and achieve and be and do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just see it and I know I'm speaking. So any of the panellists or anyone in comments, if you've got anything to say, please say, because we're coming to the end. So if you've got any questions, please put them in now. But one of my passions about breaking the cycle is if we're able to see it ourselves, you know, with other schools, I'd like to see, you know, the work that David and Thomas do, that we're able to, if we as adults are able to recognise and have an awareness of our emotions and the physicality that we then are able to offer that to our children in different ways that is age appropriate. But that's something, something going back to age appropriate, who decides what's age appropriate? Because that's one thing, you know, that question, you know, and I will go back to it um, because we often try and hide from it sometimes. Sexual abuse is not a nice to topic. However, as a child, if we never talk about it, how do we give children permission to actually tell about a 
trusted adult of what they're doing to keep them safe. So that's where I come from on proactive protection. What are your thoughts, gentlemen? Um, I think, uh, yes, I think we have to give signals. Um, we can't, children have to know that it is a safe and trusted environment. Mm. Um, something that Chris said earlier about uh, that adult, we need that, uh, we need, every child needs that irrationally crazy adult to actually be there for them, to be a voice, to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and if they get that, um, there is a huge amount of hope. And as Chris just said earlier, um, the sky's the limit then in terms of the art of the possible, what's possible for us. Because otherwise this can become quite a circular and quite depressing conversation. It's really important, yeah, it's really important to recognize that uh, we have exceptional children who are miraculous in their inner strengths and their agency mm -hmm. and their way of turning it around. And I think they're naturally future leaders. So if you guys look at what you're doing right now, genuinely, and you think about the leadership that you're giving to so many people, um, you know, the greatest wounds lie beside the greatest gifts they really do. Absolutely. So, uh, and that, and, and you, you're kind of the pathway to the future, you three in particular. It really shows us, the rest of us. So I'm pleased to be involved, I have to say, to Thank meet you, people Thomas. with you. Thank you, Thomas. And then just, just to add to that, because we've talked a lot about um, the, the physical nature of this and the physical nature of trauma, that it, it, can, it, it can seem a little bit, sometimes it can f seem or feel even a little bit doom and gloom. Okay, this has happened to me, so this is this, I'm bound to end up in this situation. So I'm really glad Chris brought that up. I think that if we talk about that physical nature, our brains are so have so much neuroplasticity, so much uh, potential to potential to change and that old saying about uh, old dogs can't learn new tricks it's just it's just not true it's a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lie so i think that when we're working with our when we're working with our children it's really important to work with our with work with our adults and um uh, i'm an ot by background an occupational therapist by background so i really believe um really believe in small small manageable changes that are day-to-day -day mean something to us yeah. And they, those can make the biggest impact, and that and that's that really focuses on how we build our resilience. Who we, who do we talk? Who do we talk to? When do we talk to them? What are we choosing to eat? How maybe how hard we're working, <laughs> and when we're choosing to stop work. Um, we're putting yeah. all those structures in place to build build our our resilience. And um, there's a little saying that Thomas and I have, which is uh, emotion uh, emotionally he healthy adults make emotionally healthy children. And that's one of our one of our focuses in the school. Yeah. And we yeah. really we really push for our, our staff team to engage in the in in their emotional well well being. Absolutely, absolutely. So be mindful of time. Has anyone got any questions that they'd like answered? And even if you don't have a question at the moment, if after this you do have a question, you will be getting a follow up email. Not tonight, but tomorrow. Um, please. Um, email that question because we can answer it and anyone attending professionally that would like a certificate of attendance again um, you will be asked about this in your follow-up email and we can provide that but as we said it has been quite a deep conversation but this is also about recovery now there were some things that were talked about today that just naturally came up and I'm a big believer of the universe so I just want to share with you something positive. So on the left-hand side is a young girl who's six. She's the eldest of six siblings. She's been in care for two years. Um, she's already been abused by her dad. Um, when the police came to take the children away from the family home, she, they were taken in a black Mariah and taken into care just like that. But they were taken for negligence. There was no food, they had no clothes. So with the right environment, and I go back to environment, she started to blossom. However, she was also regularly sent back to her parents. And at the age of 10, when her parents had an additional three children, so there were six in total, all six children went back home to live with mum and dad in time for Christmas. Yes, but it wasn't. She was having night terrors three nights in a row because the one thing she didn't want to do was go home because she was also now being abused by a friend as well of her dad because that's how close it is. However, three years later, she went back into care and that's because the adults around were very 
vocal and they contacted different people, including the NSPCC. So she went back into care and all the siblings did, although they went into different children's home and different authorities because of procedures. At 15, she was very lucky and she was fostered by her English teacher. However, as we've touched on earlier today, she wanted to be part of a normal family, but didn't know how to, because she had only learned how to live in a dysfunctional family. And sadly, at the age of 16, it broke down. So she had her 13th social worker in 14 years. She lived in a hostel. And so now she had to check in every two weeks. And the expectation of her, not because she'd done anything wrong, what had happened to her was that she'd been in care because of her family breakdown. The expectation of her was minimal. And at Christmas in 1977, when she was 16, sitting around the Christmas table with five other vulnerable young people, she realised that although there were lots of adults around her no and them, no one had actually asked them their story or enabled them to have a voice in any way, shape or form. And she always knew that one day she would use her voice to raise awareness for other survivors, for herself, but also for raising awareness to enable conversations like this. And that in turn would break the cycle for many others, adults, children, young people. So then I want to show you, there's that young girl who's grown up and actually that young girl and that model is me. So I want to say a big heartfelt thank you to my panelists, to everybody who's taken part to open this conversation because we can move forward. And unless we have the courage to have conversations like this, the silence will only exacerbate the trauma, the stress and the illness, but we can make a difference. So thank you to all of the panel. Um, Alethea, before we go, are there any comments to be read out from everyone? And thank you everyone who signed up today because we can't do this alone. By coming together, we make individual voices into a greater sound and we spread what we do in a wider way. Just some um, comments about how people are enjoying and appreciating the content of, of the talk today. And um, there, there, I just want to mention that there's people dialing in from the States or somebody who's facing this conference. So I didn't get a chance to read out her description of you know her interest, but just wanted to say thank you for everybody who's taken the time to put a comment down today. Thank you. Carol, last word from you before we go. Yeah, I just want to say um, it's been a real um, heartfelt um, session today. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, do take care of yourself tonight. I'm sure on reflection there'll be things that will come up for people as well. So, yeah, just take a little bit of extra care over the next couple of days um, because some of these things will have hit quite hard to some people. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much for the invitation. My pleasure. David, I'm not leaving you to last this time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But, uh, th thank you very much, Beverly, for, for the invitation and thank you for everyone for listening. Um, and you know, watch watching the, the the moving, having this discussion, you learn every you learn you think you know a lot, but you learn something new every every single time. And I always, you know, having such a it was nice that everyone created such a a a safe atmosphere to reflect, uh, and I find that very very useful. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Um, just thank you to everyone. Really, um, awareness are raising early intervention and being the best role model we can be for our young people and to help them move forwards and to help the adults change their lives so that their children's lives are changed is my passion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thomas. Um, Chris, I, I almost want to say ditto because that was brilliant what you just said, Chris. Um, I, I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot from the video. I'm off to do no work whatsoever. I'm stopping work. 
that's it. Um, but I genuinely enjoyed it. And Bev, um, it's in inspirational to see what you, Chris, um, and Carol do, genuinely. Uh, we think we've got tough jobs, my God. You guys are amazing. So thank you for inviting us, and thank you for everyone that's been involved. I really enjoyed it. It felt very safe. As David said, it felt a nice space. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And Alethea, last but certainly not least, and thank you so much for your important role, what you've been doing today. Um, we'd like to hear from you, yourself. Oh, it's been such an inspirational time today. Although I've been navigating the chat box, I always learn something new when, you know, when taking part in things like this. And I just want to thank you and for everybody who's you know, been brave enough, courageous enough to share and, and, and have their voices heard. So thanks to you, Beverly, and the other panellists and everybody who's on the, on the chat today. And is there anyone else that's made a comment? Because I wouldn't, if there's someone there to be heard, you know, is there anyone there? Just feedback, like very inspirational and, you know, I think it's brilliant and helpful. Thank you. There's no other questions coming up that I can see. Right. So the last word is going to be about self-care. We've touched on that already. So please, please, um, tonight, just give yourself little bit of extra loving, ask yourself a question that I often do. What do I need tonight and what do I want? Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. And um, we'll end this webinar now and the conversation for, and we will do continue another day. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.